Hello and welcome. So this is the 100th video in my Homebrew Pipeline CPU series and I thought I'd do something slightly different. I've been building this for a couple of years now and one of my initial goals on this project was to have it compare favorably with the 8-bit microcomputers that I grew up programming and first experienced as uh, my entry into computer science. So let's have a think about how we can go about benchmarking and profiling the build to get an idea for how well it compares. Okay, so this is my pipeline CPU. Now the blue boards in the middle are the actual CPU core itself. And the design of that is pretty close to final. There might be a few bits of tweak and bug fixing as I move it towards its uh, final configuration. I've got the serial port, which is my main means to communicate with it. Here's the sound device here, which is four basic channels. And over here is the VGA circuit. And this is where things are starting to get interesting in terms of what I can demonstrate to people. Of course, anything involving moving graphics around requires some real CPU performance. And so that's the thing that we really want to have a look at. OK, so I was discussing the whole question of benchmarking with some people on my Discord channel. And I was pointed at a YouTube channel from Matt Heffernan at Sliffy Games. And I really quite like what he's been doing. He has this video series he calls an 8-bit battle royale where he's written a Mandelbrot program, which is a fractal that requires a decent amount of mathematics. And he's been running it on various 8-bit systems in order to compare the performance between them. And so this is absolutely perfect. And it's going to save me a lot of time in trying to uh, get a piece of code that I can do comparisons between my CPU and other 8-bit micros. I'll provide a link to this channel and series in the description. It's an enjoyable watch. So here we see him testing his Mandelbrot code on the Commander X16. So he's running this at uh, quite low resolution to have the uh, slower entrance complete in a reasonable amount of time. But if we skip forward and find his final leaderboard, you can see the Commander X16 is way out in front with completing that rendering in 3.2 seconds, all the way down to the Commodore 64 in 26.4 seconds. And usefully, his videos link to the source code to his Mandelbrot benchmark program in both 6502 and Z80 assembly language. So I was able to take a copy of that, and I've spent some time porting it to my homebrew pipeline CPU. Now, I won't bore everyone with the, the detail of what I did to get that working and the, uh, the choices I made doing it. But um, in the description, there's going to be a link to a video on my second channel, which will take you through the porting experience and what were the challenges. So the important thing now is I've got the code running. Let's take a look and see how it compares. Right, OK, so I've got an 8 megahertz crystal in here with a two times divider so that the whole CPU is running at 4 megahertz at the moment. I think this is actually a pretty reasonable, stable speed to be running the CPU at for most of the time. I will be doing a video in the future where I kind of look into exactly how fast we can run it and do some exploration of what's causing the limitation. But for now, let's just run the Mandelbrot benchmark program and see how quick it is. Fantastic. Okay, I've run this a bunch of times as well and, and timed it. And the average time I recorded was 1.3 seconds. Okay, so the Mandelbrot here is quite low resolution. It's 32 by 22. And he obviously did this to meet the lowest common denominator display capabilities between the various 8-bit micros he was comparing on. But I did modify a copy of it slightly in order to run at the maximum 80 by 60 my VGA hardware can currently display. Let's have a quick look at that. So I'm not going to call this high resolution, but obviously it takes a bit longer to draw because we've got quite a bit more maths, but it does uh, fill the screen up at the highest resolution I can display. Look, it does look quite nice. At some point, I'll adapt this into one that can actively zoom in, although the update rate won't be particularly impressive. Okay, now this is absolutely awesome. We've clearly beat the current first place. Now, I did have a passing conversation with um, Matt on Twitter and he doesn't want to start including one-off boutique devices like this in the leaderboard. 
But I think we've got a, a, a pretty solid hit victory here for our own uh, confidence. OK, so the point of this series was to experiment with kind of modern pipeline CPU concepts in an 8-bit CPU. And I think the results we've got really speak for themselves. I cannot describe how pleased I am with the result that this whole project has, uh, has worked as well as I'd hoped at the start. Let's look back at that table of results, though, and see if we can break down the information a bit more. So we've got the Homebrew Pipeline CPU and the original five entries in the table. The processors they're running on, the Commander X16 is a 65CO2, the BBC is a 6502, the Amstrad CPC464 is a Z80, the Spectrum is a Z80, and the Commodore 64 is a 6510, which is a derivative of this 6502 again. But performance is a derivative of how well the code's written, the efficiency of the instruction set for achieving it, operations per cycle to execute that code, and of course the clock rate of the CPU. Now the Hobrew CPU is clocked at 4 megahertz. The Commander X16 is 8, the BBC is 2, the Amstrad is 4, Spectrum is 3.5, and the Commodore 64 is 1.023 megahertz. So the clock rate is clearly a significant part of that, but uh, if we want to look at the other factors, we can normalize that by multiplying the execution time by the clock rate to essentially see how long it would have taken were they all clocked at 1 megahertz. So here the homebrew CPU would have taken 5.2 seconds. The Commander X16 though would have taken 25.6 seconds. The BBC is very similar time, which we shouldn't be surprised about there. Um, the Commodore 64 is slightly slower at 27. And then the 464 and the Spectrum are 51 and 47 respectively. Now these are all kind of clustered up by the type of CPU. There are always gonna be some small differences there because the code has to draw the results on the screen and so the code necessary to run there will be slightly different. And there'll be small architectural choices but in the systems and some slightly different versions of those processors being used. But when we normalize for frequency like this, the separation between the homebrew pipeline CPU and the other contenders is even larger. And I'm incredibly pleased about that. OK, so after you've taken the clock rate out of the equation, it's all about how good the code is and how efficiently the processor turns instructions into actual operations um, per clock. So in my prime numbers demo, I showed a table of instructions per clock. And these figures, though, are a little bit vague because different instructions take different lengths of time. And so the actual average number of instructions per clock you'll see will be slightly dependent on the code you're running. So because we're using this Mandelbrot code as a benchmark, I want to kind of take a look and see what we're getting because I haven't spent as much time fine-tune optimizing this particular piece of code. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so we're not actually computing a Mandelbrot or anything else at the moment. So I imagine the monitor loader program is actually just sat there in a tight little loop trying to wait for some input from the serial port to uh, take an instruction of what to do. So I'm actually gonna restart the Mandelbrot program and then slow it right down so we can see what's going on. So this is the slowest interactive clock rate I can, I can run the CPU at. It's gonna take ages to generate a single pixel, but we can actually get some kind of a clue what's happening. I can even switch it into break mode and single step it. Now here we see instructions progressing up the pipeline here we've got the, an instruction being fetched, one being executed in pipeline stage one, and one being executed in pipeline stage two. Here we see a knob being dispatched from the fetch unit. Now there's two reasons for a knob to exist in our pipeline. Number one, we've actually written a knob in the program code. And there's a few places where we legitimately do that because we just need to sequence the operations a little bit better because we've got some overlapping stuff and we don't want to have clashes going on. But the other reason is because the fetch unit has generated a knob. And that could be for any one of a couple of reasons, but predominantly it's because something else is accessing memory and the fetch unit needs to access memory in order to fetch the next instruction to be dispatched. So in order to calculate our instructions per clock, what we really need to do is run it for a fixed number of clocks and find out exactly how many instructions we actually execute i.e. how many times the instruction at the top is not a knob. 
Now conveniently when I made this temporary back plane I did include a header here which will show us the instruction that pops off the top when pipeline stage 2 has finished executing it. So what I want to do is build a circuit that tells me if the instruction there is a NOP or not. Right, so this is a 4078B which is a 8 input NOR gate. Now this is a chip I actually contemplated using for the ALU result in order to generate the zero flag but in the end I kind of stuck with the solution I used which avoided using anything other than the 7.4 series logic devices. So power and ground are in exactly the same place on any of the 7.4 series chips we use. We've got four inputs on one side and four on the other. Now it doesn't actually matter which order these go into the output. And we could do with some power and let's see if we can output our result. That's the output. Okay, so what the LED is doing is it's showing us whenever there's a knob. So it's out at the moment. Now we've got a knob progressing up the pipeline here. Whenever we see a knob at the top here, the LED comes on. That's awesome. That's exactly what we want. Now, what I'd like to do is count those a little bit quicker than manually. Let's try using an Arduino for this. Now, what I'm going to select is pin 20, which is one I can drive an interrupt from, and pin 23 as an input. So the clock is closest availability is there. Okay, so this has started outputting the number of clocks and the number of instructions it detects. Let's fire this back up. Okay, I think we need to turn the clock rate back up a little bit, although we're never going to be able to run it at the full crystal 4 megahertz. We're seeing 170 something instructions executed in 270 odd clocks. So that's coming in at about 0.65 instructions per clock. Now that's slightly lower than the 0.81 I've quoted before, but that was running different code which was probably much more tightly optimized, but also this Mandelbrot code, it is going to be slower because before I was doing operations that were heavily math based around small bite size integers, and we've got four one byte registers for G as GPRs, but the Mandelbrot uses larger values. So there's a lot more swapping in and out of memory, and that's going to be stalling the fetch a bit more. Now I could probably speed this up a load by hand optimizing it to the same level I, I did those operations and you know maybe we can get this up by an extra 10%, 20%, something like that. But actually in a real world example we are running pretty fast here. Um, I'm actually pretty pleased with this. A lot are over 60 and that's still significantly more efficient um, in terms of just the number of instructions we can dispatch compared to the 6502 or Z80. I think it might be worth trying a few other bits of code as well and see what we can get out of it. Okay, so what I've done here is I've written a new piece of code which does lots and lots of integer divisions, which is a complicated math function, but it's one that I've very highly optimized. Okay, so what we're seeing here is about 0.84 instructions per clock tick. So this is slightly higher than what we saw on the earlier tests. And I've gone through and looked at a few different bits of code, some of the less optimized stuff and some of the more optimized stuff, and kind of added them all together on a spreadsheet. I'm gonna kind of quote a slightly lower average of probably about 0.75 instructions per, per clock that I'm actually seeing with real world code. And of course, that's a nice round number. So when we run at four megahertz, what we're actually seeing here is a nice round three MIPS approximately. So I'm pretty pleased with that. Okay, so as you can imagine, I'm really proud of this benchmarking session. The results have really shown that the, the build really is achieving the kind of things I set out to do. But if we ask that question, is it the most powerful 8-bit system? No, it's not going to be. The truth is there are more modern 8-bit CPUs, particularly in the microcontroller space, 
that um, used this kind of pipeline design that I've used. And, and they will actually generate a, a much better performance profile than those Z80 and 6502 devices that were really designed in the 1970s. So if I was the marketing department of a 1980s microcomputer manufacturer, maybe I'd be using these numbers to claim that, but I'm not going to do that. Some of the 8-bit microcontrollers that exist now are clocked at you know tens or even more than 100 megahertz. So their overall throughput is tremendously high compared to anything I'm ever going to achieve on discrete logic components like the build you see here. But as it is, the fact that I've built a computer from scratch using discrete components that outperforms the first computers that I ever owned and did some a lot of my early programming on is something I'm tremendously happy about. And you know, it's a it's the biggest mark of success for this project so far I can I can show. So hopefully you'll be hanging around for some of the, the future videos I'll be doing. I'm going to finish off the VGA circuit. There's a little bit of finishing off to do on, on sound. And I've got a little project I'm going to be spinning up soon where I talk about some storage for the system. But I really hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks a lot for watching. Hit the old uh, subscribe and notify if you uh, haven't already done so. And I will see you again soon. Goodbye.